Okay, students, welcome to lecture. Good. Uh, this is the last regular lecture for Summer B, and uh, we'll have a mini review at the end of lecture today. So we'll have a regular first half of lecture, and then, and then tomorrow we'll have the final exam. Be here, and you, you know, you can get here early, and I recommend that. Uh, there's no class in front of us for about an hour. But who gets here early? How, how early do you get here? Like one, two o'clock? So, yeah, so you could definitely do that. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about radioactive nuclear decay reactions in a few contexts today. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I want to go through a great example as promised. I was, I was hoping to do it Monday. We didn't have it yet Monday. We didn't have it yesterday. We're going to have it today. All right. And uh, what we're going to do, it, we're going to be able to do um, best two exams, and we now have all the homework in. So you'll be, whatever, what I do in an example today, uh, is uh, you'll be able to do, um, you know, with your uh, data if you look in the grade book and stuff like that. Okay, so um, here we go with our example. Um, the specs for grading right now are the following. There's a total of 168 possible uh, homework points in your grade book. Now, we convert that to something out of 25, and um, I've already uh, started doing that, but um, the homework um, is three uh, piles of points of various origin. So uh, the first is the little tiny one, extra electric field practice. That should be EEFP. In web courses, we only had one of those, 16 out of the 168. And then we had 97 total regular homework. Now, that's not counting the mega review. And it's not counting the fias the uh, Bernoulli Chapter 11 fiasco assignments. All right? But you do have some of the Chapter 11 stuff on the mega review. It will be on the exam. It won't be, you know, tremendous because it's mostly going to be electricity and magnetism, but it w we will have a little bit of that. Okay, so 97 points there. And then 55 from the five written homeworks. Okay, so there's, so everybody was graded once for 15 points and then four times, if you did all of them, four times for 10 points. Okay, so those add up to 55 or fewer and... Uh, let me just uh, back up to uh, 1B there for a second about Wiley Plus. Uh, apparently, uh, Wiley Plus is up to its usual antics uh, with uh, not downloading grades properly from Wiley Plus into Canvas. And so I'm going to make a conversion. Uh, in fact, I've already done it. it. You should be able to see that row in your grade book. And we're, we're going to convert the uh, chapter 27 and the light waves assignments uh, that you've done uh, previous, you know, the, uh, what was it, chapter 27, that was due Monday. Uh, so I'll do a conversion of that and a conversion of light waves. And then I'll do a conversion of the mega review. So the data aren't all, Actually, you know what? If you if you know what your grade is over in uh, what you call it, uh, Wiley Plus, Wiley Plus has got it. Okay. Uh, Wiley Plus has got it, and so if you look up there, you'll be able to figure out what's us uh, supposed to be in our grades page here in Web Courses, but isn't quite cutting it. 
but it will, and I'll post those, uh, although it might not be before the test. But if you go and look in, in uh, Wiley Plus, you'll be able to figure everything out. Everything that we do today, you should be able to figure out. Uh, clicking, a uh, couple things here you should jot down. And I've already figured out your clicking pointage and the clicking bonus, if you got it. Here, here are the specs. Uh, 29 questions uh, over the past six weeks, um, so, you know, about, you know, 50, this is lecture 22, so in about 19 lectures, okay? And several of them uh, were for practice, so uh, about 15 lectures, I guess, we had uh, for regular questions. Um, the 85% level of that is 25%, 25 questions answered or more. So if you look in the grades page and the roundup for 0731, I did all this yesterday after lecture, um, if that reads for your clicker answers, if that's 25 or more, just pencil your sin, pencil yourself in for 25 points uh, in your semester grade. Now, if you're below that, then we'll use the proportion, and I'll do an example of that in a few minutes. And we scale that down with that proportion, as we've already done once this semester, uh, to something out of 25, something below 25 for most of you. And actually, I've already done that for everybody. It's in your grades page. By the way, 76% of class had 23 or more points for participation. 23 out of 25, that's 92%. That's, that's an A on participation. So that's very nice. And not many people were out of the 20s. And there were, I saw a few teens, uh, but you'll, you'll be able to see what you've got. Uh, for those of you that haven't been coming to class a lot, you're gonna be scoring pretty low. But we'll do an example of that. The performance bonus. If, you're, <clears throat> if you answered 75% of the questions correctly, then you get four bonus points. So f f out of 29, that means if you've answered 22 or more correctly, and that's in the other roundup figure, okay? Um, so that's uh, correct roundup July 31st in your grades page, all right? And if you didn't get 20, if you got 21, you did good, but you don't get the bonus points. You have to get a B on the, the clicking in class. And about, this one's different, about 10% of the class snagged these bonus points. And it's, I know some of you, you were trying to get to that and you, you didn't, uh, but we got other bonus point activity running. We're gonna do some today uh, at the end of class, so. Um, and remember, the, uh, the basic data that I upload is, uh, or that, that actually I export from the iClicker software, uh, gives me uh, two numbers encoded as one. A whole number tells me how many uh, you got right, and the decimal part um, to the hundredths place tell, tells me how, how many you answered. So you might have, you know, 18.25, meaning you answered 25 questions, 18 of them correct. Question. Yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, They're, they've been in there the whole semester. That's matter of fact, those are the first things in the grade book. So, yeah, they they ain't going anywhere. And we're we're adding some more bonus to it. Hopefully, if you've done the bon the mega review and stuff, which I heard some people have have not done the mega review yet in office hours, and they said, "Oh, I'm going to do it tonight." And uh, hopefully, that'll help you. They were bugging me in office, in office hours. Well, they weren't bugging me, but they were giving me the business. Dr. B, what should we study? And I said, study everything, you know. 
But you know, you can't, you can't, but in practical terms, you can't study everything. So start with lecture notes and exams. You know, the three that you have, that you carried out of each midterm. Uh, the review sheet that you're gonna have today, the mega review. I mean, I don't put the mega review up there just so you have something to do, you know, while you're, while you're bored at home. You know, it's something to help you get ready for the exam and crush the exam. All right, now let's do an example. So here's John Q. Student. I'll go ahead and jot these numbers down. Let's say that John Q. Student has, um, as of yesterday, 117 out of 168 homework-wise. All right, now that's, that's good, but it's not 100%, so he, he's not going to get 25. Uh, let's say that he has 22 out of 29. That's below the 85% point, so we're going to do that uh, by proportion. Uh, his best two it is easy, best two out of three midterms. Let's just say that John Q. Student has a 32 and a 37. All right. And then our safe assumption is that your lab grade or that John Q. student's lab grade is 90%. Now, some of you have over 90%. That's lovely. And I'll use whatever your lab TA sends me up to including unusual percentages. How many here know that they have a, a lab grade above 100%? Yeah, apparently there's a, there's a lab TA that gives bonus points. That's my trick. I don't know. Anyways. But so you may have, you'll probably have, I was told at the beginning of the semester that most everybody will have, you know, in the, be in the 90s and stuff like that, so. Question. No, if I if I if I round up, if if I I go by percentage, that's correct. I'll have a percentage. If the percentage is, for instance, fifty one point zero 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 one. Wait a minute. What did I just say? Fifty. 51.0001, I'll round that up to 52, okay? If it's, so anything above 51 goes to 52. Probably, yeah, yeah, so. All right, now this one, as I, you know, this is the one, and I don't know what your guys, I haven't gotten any lab grades yet, so. But you guys will know, have a good idea. Who still has to do labs tomorrow? Oh, that's grievous. Yeah, nothing to do about it. I mean, that's summer B. What do you want? All right, so now here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to figure this question out. My last yellow block here, what do I need for an A, for a semester A. You know, what does John Q. student need to get a semester A? We're going to figure that out. All right? Now, here we go with the first thing. We, the first two blocks here, homework and clicking, we have to convert to something out of 25. Let's do the first one. Homework. 117 over 168. That's about 69.6%. .6%. Just multiply that by 25. And Kara, that comes in at 17.4, and so that one rounds up to 18. All right, so jot that one down, straight percentage, and then round up. So, uh, so homework, this particular student, 18 out of 20, Cinco. All right, so that's all right. That's a 72%, roughly. All right, now here's clicking. Now this one is a little trickier. You take your answering percentage, so this student has 22 out of the 29. You compute that percentage, divide by 0 0.85, the baseline percentage, 
And then you solve the equation. You basically multiply that by 25. All right, so go ahead and calculate that. Solve for the pointage value. See if you can verify me on this. And usually I do a lot more clicker questions, but we had some technical problems with clicking, so I had to streamline the number of clicks. What do you come up with? Who's got a, who's got a, what do you got? 23.31? 22.31? And that goes up to? 23. All right, so there's what John, now he's doing a lot better. And notice, notice that this is 92%, that's an A on clicking. And uh, as I said, 70, I think it's 76% of class have at least this many uh, dineros for clicking, all right? And the clicking is much more uh, forgiving uh, because of the 85% factor, all right? Now, best two out of three, we already know that, just add them up. So that's 69 out of 100, that's the cinchy one. And then the lab grade is pretty cinchy as well. 90% of 60 is uh, 54 out of 60. And that one I would round up as well. If you come in a little bit below, you know, a whole number, I'll uh, round up to that next whole number. So we're still left with this question over here. What do I need to get uh, to, uh, to get an A on the final? All right, and I know, or, and we're gonna actually do what do I need to do to get a B on the final? What do I need to do to get a C on the final? And what do I need to do to get a, a D on the final? That'll be pretty easy to see for this example. Now I know you guys are shooting for more than a D and a lot of you are trying to shoot for an A and more power to you if you can crush my final. And I predict I make a bold prediction that there's somebody to the left of you. No, you look left. Don't look right. Come on, Dominic. Okay. You, you looked over there, man. Okay. <laughs> somebody to the right of you, somebody in front of you, somebody behind you has never crushed an exam in this class and is going to crush the exam tomorrow. I don't know who it is, but I'll be able to see it as soon as I get the scores. And I'll look at that student and I'll say, well done, you did it. At the last moment, you did it. And I see some guys up in the back over here, I'm not looking at them right now, and they're laughing, no, that can't be me. Yeah, it could be you. So don't, and, and really I'm serious, I'm not just joking around, it's gonna happen, I know. Especially a class this size. Even for guys that look right when they're supposed to look left. Okay, that's all right. Now, we're gonna figure this out. Now, let's look at the points, you know, to figure out what you need on the final, you gotta add up what you got right now. All right, so what's the sum total here? Is that right? That's not right, is it? 18 plus 23? 164? Oh, Lord. How did I type it? That must be a typo. Let me fix that. Okay. So, typo repaired. Uh, 164 going into the final... Uh, so you can now figure out if you look at the syllabus. Now here's from the amended syllabus. This and and you guys after the final. After the final, I go by points. I don't go by percentages and stuff. Okay. So if you have the points, you get the grade. If you don't have the points, 
you don't get the grade, all right? So 279 is what the student needs. Now they've got 164. So what you can do is just subtract 164 from 279. Matter of fact, you can go all the way down. Now the thing is, they've already got a D. You know, they've already got more than they need to get a D. So they're passing, even if they don't show up for the final. All right? Now what they want to do is crush the final. Now the problem is that no matter what, the final's not, if you crush it, you're still not going to grab 115 on the final. So these are the things that you need over here, or this particular student needs. Now 69 uh, out of 100 on the final, that's doable for this student, because they, look at this, 69 out of 100 on the best two midterms. So if they go by the average of previous work, you know, they're going to have a good shot at getting a B. If they do better than that, you know, so much the better. Uh, C, they need to, you know, do 22 points worth. So, you know, they're going to be somewhere in the Bs probably. Uh, and if they get below a B, they're going to, it'll be because, you know, they just, I don't know, scored low. And a D is out of range, so they're not going to flunk this particular, this John Q student here. And you know what, guys? <clears throat> Let me just point something out to you here. The nicest chunk of change here is uh, the lab grade. It's a good percentage, and it's big. You know, the other good percentage that they have is uh, the clickers. And that's nice, but it's not as big as the lab grades. So you guys, now when you guys are doing this uh, tonight or this at, later this afternoon, uh, yeah, just figure out what you got and then do what we just did. And oh, by the way, that's without adding in the, the bonus points. Now, I hope that almost everyone in here has a bonus point or two. You know, you got the mega review going right now in Wiley Plus. We've had some early iClicker registration. And every, you know what? Everybody that took the test, uh, number three and test number two is going to get a bonus point for not messing up their PID. So that's, so everybody's, there's only one person that didn't make it to the exam three. One. So almost everybody's going to get that bonus point. So when you, when you get your bonus points, um, add them in here. Oops, that still says 154. Add them in here to your pile of regular points or subtract it over here, you know. You know, so if you get four bonus points, all right, I only, to get an A, I only need 111. Still, still shooting high. But if you, you know what? Here's the other thing that I didn't mention. I sometimes put bonus questions on the exam. So that would be like question number 51, question number 52 for a couple bonus points each so that you can actually get over 100% if you crush the final. All right, so that's a possible. So you know, so the thing is, if you've got some bonus points racked up, good, subtract it off what you need over here in this column, All right? And then try to do this one without a typo. Uh, in the black T-shirt. I was just wondering. So for the first week, we had four extra bonus points. Right? If you registered on time, yeah. Okay, so that'd be a extra four. Yeah, so subtract that from those numbers in the blue, etc. Yes. Alexis. The question is, Anna, I was grilled in office hours about the mega review. How many points is that going to be? And the same thing with your in-class review today. How many points is that going to be bonus-wise? And the answer is I haven't decided yet. So I just got to decide what to do. 
It's going to be somewhere between one and five. It's never more than that. Uh, Michelle, Michelle, okay. I did? When did I say that? Did I say that we had a bonus homework assignment? Six out of five. If it's already in there, then it's in there. You mean on a written homework? The web course's homework? I don't think that's possible. Oh, that's not, that, it, whatever, students, there's a little confusion here um, about this book. Whatever's in the conversion row, that's what goes into your homework, and it's already in there. Right? So any, any pointage, you know, I'm not going to be recalculating anything there. All right, so that's in there. Uh, and I think what I did there, I thought I rounded up, or I put, I put a, an extra point in there. Oh, I know, I remember now. Yeah, it's in there. If, it's, if, if you got it, it's in there. If you didn't, it's not in there. Okay. Uh, okay, another question? I, Asia. Yeah. Because you guys didn't bloop up your PID or your test form. Yeah, now if you didn't go to the second, the third exam, then you're SOL, but everybody else will get it. Uh, quest, question? Can, the question is, can you do it on the final? Well, what do you guys want to do? You want it on the final? But see, now here's the, here's the problem. If somebody messes up, I cannot tell you after the final. So you can't track them down like Chinatown <laughs> and ask them, now, why did you? But anyways, yeah, we'll do it on the final. A bonus point to help you get your NIDs and stuff. Our, one last question. Go ahead. Okay, uh, it's in it's in web courses, isn't it? If you got eleven from Daniel, it's in web courses, right? Yeah, yeah. It's whatever's in web courses from written homework. That's you know. Oh yeah, that counts. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's a that's a homework. Yeah, that's a bonus point on homework. So that that goes into the 25 point conversion. So that's not like a test bonus point. All right. Yes, Kimberly. What? Repeat? Yeah, that's because there's all those ones that I, bl that I blooped up you know, the Bernoulli stuff. And there was stuff in there that I was, that's still in there from when I was messing around with it. So the, the, the total that I have listed there, that's all the, that's the Wiley plus 97. You shouldn't, I don't think. But I'm gonna redo, I'm gonna redo the, I have to do the light wave and the chapter 27, so. All right, let's keep going. Now, last time in physics topics, we talked about quantum electrodynamics, the quantum field theory for the electromagnetic interaction. And the most basic part of the model is 
electrons and photons interacting. And colloquially speaking, we think about it as electrons accelerating and therefore electromagnetism being created. Now, that's actually, uh, 2A and B are actually classical physics uh, concepts, uh, but you can, you, know, you can still use it as a, as a way of thinking about this little uh, diagram here. The, this idea of um, accelerating electrons, accelerating positrons, protons and stuff, and radiation, uh, be, be the source of radiation, that's actually like um, a, a model of radiation emission called bremsstrahlung, which is mentioned in chapter 30, uh, section 7. And uh, that's basic, that's a German word for the, uh, the rays that come from breaking, from hitting the brakes, changing directions. Uh, and, uh, and I'll show you a device uh, that, uh, you know, that, that makes use of Bremsstrahlung. Uh, in practice, uh, when a nucleus of an atom uh, breaks, uh, puts the brakes to an electron, we get a spectrum of X-rays, and uh, this is what you get. It, it, it frequently looks something like this. There's this kind of a curve. Uh, that's the Bremsstrahlung uh, curve. And then you get these spikes, okay, so the peaks on top of the Bremsstrahlung continuum, uh, and th they're actually useful as identification. Uh, because as the textbook mentions uh, for figure 30.19, uh, the sharp peaks are called characteristic X-rays, and uh, they're characteristic of the target material. So if you're using aluminum, if you're using iron, if you're using uh, silver, you know, palladium, you know, platinum, any metal, it's going to have its own characteristic fingerprints on top of that kind of smooth curve. And that little factor, lambda naught, lambda zero, uh, on the far left of that diagram, that's the cutoff wavelength. Uh, and th that is also... Um, uh, that's not part of the, the uh, that's not an identifier for the, uh, for the, uh, for the metal uh, that breaks the, uh, puts the brakes on the electrons, but it is, uh, it's related to the, uh, the kinetic energy of the electrons. Now, and therefore to, to the de Broglie wavelength. Now look at this, look at these wavelengths. This is in nanometers, 0.04. That's where, that's where we were down here yesterday, a little bit smaller than 0.02. I think we had 0.013 or something like that uh, nanometers, and you know. So you're, and th these are these wavelengths here, X-ray wavelengths, a fraction of a nanometer. Yeah, that's that's the s typical for spacing of atoms in a crystal, in a molecule, uh, in any kind of an ionic substance. Uh, you're talking, you know, maybe an angstrom or so, or maybe a few fractions of an angstrom between atoms. So that's realistic, and that's why X-rays are useful in X-ray diffraction, and that's why Rosalind Franklin, who didn't get the Nobel Prize, uh, but ought to have gotten it, she was ripped off. Well, she had died by the time they got it, and they, they, they don't give it to people that are, you know, they don't do posthumous Nobel Prizes, so that's the excuse they gave. But she deserved it. She made the image. She cracked it, uh, and she used X-rays. So uh, here's a device. This is an X-ray tube. Some of you are going into medical practice. You'll be looking at X-rays. Uh, so you basically take, um, you know, some potential here between the source of the electrons, this filament. They kind of they kind of boil off the f filament, and then they get accelerated through this voltage here, and then they hit this metal target up here, and that target identifies itself in these peaks. Okay, so those are like fingerprints for different metals. Aluminum, silver, gold, blah, blah, blah-de-blah, -blah, all through the, uh, 
table of elements of metals anyways. So that's figure 38T. So this is, this is the device that makes the x-rays and when you analyze them uh, by wavelength uh, for the uh, intensity, uh, you get a spectrum that looks like this. It's kind of interesting. Okay, radioactive decay. Let's talk about this. Uh, radioactive decay modes, nuclear decay modes. Uh, basically, the, the three nuclear decay modes that we think about in everyday life now for the past 120 years or so uh, are alpha, beta, and gamma uh, decay. And nuclei emit alpha particles they emit betas, which are electrons, and they emit gammas, which are photons. And people were studying these mysterious rays because um, they, they could put a radioactive source. You know, people like uh, Marie Curie, you know, she discovered, I think, radium or something like that, and x-rays. Henri Baccarel, that discovered how x-rays work. Uh, they didn't know what these rays were. They could... You know, they could light up a phosphorescent um, piece of glass, you know, painted with phosphorescent stuff. And if it was in a magnetic field, they could steer the beams. And that, so they knew that they had three different kinds of rays, but, you know, they didn't really know much. Initially, they didn't know much about the nucleus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so alpha particle. Alpha particle emission uh, is... Uh, when, when your nucleus is slightly unstable, uh, it will want to get to a more stable energy by emitting some nuclei, uh, by emitting a, an alpha particle. Now, what is an alpha particle? It's identical to the helium-4 nucleus, and that's pictured here. Uh, two protons and two um, neutrons. That's helium-4 nucleus. Um, and that's it's booted out of the big nucleus. So the nucleus changes to another element. Um, and a little bit of helium nuclei is, is, is bolted out of there. And you've heard of the aurora borealis and the aurora australis, the southern and northern lights. That comes from the solar wind. Now, most of the solar wind is protons, which are, the, are hydrogen nuclei, and electrons, which are, you know, orbiting. But there's also some alpha particles in the solar wind. And so uh, they'll, you know, uh, they're all streaming and boiling off the surface of the sun. Okay. And you may think to yourself, Dr. B, if... If a, if a nucleus of an atom is, contains positive protons and neutral neutrons, don't the, don't the protons repel each other? Well, they would, and they do. They do, they do repel each other, but something even stronger keeps them corralled, and that's the strong nuclear force. The two nuclear forces... Uh, one of them is the force that keeps the nucleus corralled, uh, protons from blazing out away from each other, and keeps it in a nucleus. It's not infinite strength, but it's very strong. It's the strongest force in nature that we know. The weak nuclear force is the one that uh, we're going to talk about with beta decay. All right, so let's talk about beta decay. Uh, basically, a proton decaying into a neutron and vice versa. Um, a neutron will naturally decay into a proton after a certain amount of time. And the neutron has a half-life. And it has a half-life if you have a thousand uh, neutrons. After one half-life, uh, you have 500 neutrons and 500 protons. They've decayed and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, positron and electron will be outgoing. And you know what? I forgot to put it in the notes here. Uh, so this would be uh, C, uh, 2C. Along with positrons 
or electrons. Uh, you also get something called a neutrino, N-E-U-T-R-I-N-O. Now, I'm not gonna go over neutrinos very much, except to say that they're very small, and that's why they're called a neutrino, I-N-O, meaning little in Italian, I guess, and N-E-U-T-R, meaning neutral, so literally it means little neutral one, um, and it, nobody could figure out the energy levels of beta decay until they made the hypothesis that there's something small and neutral emitted in the beta decay. I mean, they could see the, the electron. The beta is an electron. You know, so they could see nuclei emitting electrons. Um, and, but they couldn't see anything else. And it just, you know, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, did not compute. So somebody said there's got to be something else, it's got to be neutral, and it's got to carry a lot of momentum. And that's what neutrinos do. And they're in the beta decay process. The beta decay process is found in nuclear fusion reactions like the fusion reactions that take place in the sun. And uh, that, that Spider-Man movie with Doc Ock, and he's trying to control the fusion, the power of the sun and stuff like that. That's an actual engineering problem. It's a scientific problem we're trying to figure out the solution to, uh, how to contain a nuclear fusion reaction. Now, the, the alpha particle emission up here, that's a nuclear fission reaction. It, you get two separate nuclei out, your, your nucleus breaks apart a little bit. You know, and this is a pretty small fragment, the helium-4 nucleus, uh, but other nuclear reactions, you can basically take your uranium, you know, split it into two big pieces and get two nuclei out and you know, cause a nuclear chain reaction with that. Uh, but beta decay is, is something that we see in a lot of fusion reactions, which is putting uh, nuclei together. Now, the third one here, the gamma, emission, we've actually talked about it a little bit, x-rays. Um, and the phrase I put in here is the nucleus relaxing. And I mentioned that. Hold on, let me make sure this doesn't log me off here. Um, the nucleus can be in an excited state. It's kind of like, you know, a, a, you know, a hydrogen atom can have electrons at the upper orbitals, you know, like n equals five, and they're gonna wanna drop down to n equals four, n equals three, n equals two, or n equals one. That's the way nature goes. It likes to go downhill to lower potential energy. And same thing, uh, but with the strong nuclear force and the potential energy for that. Uh, and so a, a neutron, excuse me, a nucleus is going to do that, and what a nucleus emits um, as it changes energy level, it's a much heavier object, a lot more energy, and therefore the photon it emits is a lot stronger. It's an X, typically an X-ray or a gamma. Um, and so, you know, Peter, getting back to Peter Parker, Spider-Man, he was bitten by a radioactive spider uh, and gamma rays. And also the Hulk was David... Bruce Banner. But on, t on TV, I think his name is David Banner. Anyways, Bruce Banner was exposed to gamma rays and became the Hulk. But, which those are, you know, those are comic books and stuff, but uh, gamma rays are a real thing. And actually, they're pretty dangerous. So, uh, also, I'll just point out a couple things here. Gamma rays from nuclear decay, that's one of the decay modes, gamma rays are very penetrating. And they could go through the side of a mountain if they have high enough energy. Neutrinos can go through this. They're going, you, right now you've got neutrinos pouring through you, neutrinos from the sun. Uh, and they just, they're neutral and they're very small, so they don't really interact with any of the atoms in your body very much. You know, so you don't really notice it. 
But gamma rays, yeah, you definitely notice that. They fry your skin. Okay, so uh, when we're, you know, we're, we're trying to make this nuclear uh, treaty with North Korea, and they've, they've had these nuclear tests and stuff. We know that they've detonated uh, nuclear weapons underground. And the reason that we know that is because we can pick up, uh, frequently we can pick up uh, gamma rays from the nuclei that are left over, the debris underneath the mountain. And sometimes a little bit escapes out into the air and uh, we pick it up. We have planes that fly along the coast of Korea and they just have these big devices to scoop up a lot of air and put it through a mass spectrometer and just collect all the, the heavy particles in the air. And then we analyze that and we can figure out a whole lot from that. It's kind of amazing. Now let's look at some examples here. Yeah, we're doing good. Um, all right, here's an example of an alpha decay. You have a uranium-238 nucleus. That's 146 neutrons and 92 protons in this diagram. And this is not the kind of uranium that they use for weapons. The kind that they use for weapons is uranium-235. In nature, the, the bulk of uranium that we find in nature is uranium-238, 146 and 92. But um, some of the uranium that we find on Earth is uranium-235, 92 protons, uh, and 143 neutrons. And that's the one that if you put it through a mass spectrometer and separate the 235s from all the 238s, you know, gram by gram, you can make a nuclear weapon or you can make fuel for a nuclear reactor. Question, Patrick. Is that why, like, when they talk about nuclear weapons, that's why they say they have to enrich the uranium? That's right. They have to enrich the uranium. And what they're really doing is they're taking the uranium and going from a high proportion of 238 and a low proportion of 235 and putting it through a calutron or, or a, what the Iranians are doing, uh, they have a, a centrifuge and they separate it by mass and they get it you know, from 99.9% .9 238 down to 99% 238. And then they do it again in another centrifuge. And then they get it down to 98%. And then they do it again. And they get it down to 96 And eventually they get it uh, enough 235 that they want that they can use it to power a reactor. And students, you should understand this about uranium enrichment. It, it's definitely a factor. And it's going to be a factor in your lives uh, for the next you know, many decades, we're going to have to be worrying about it. The, the amount of enrichment you need to run a, a power reactor, you know, like in a submarine or a power station, is not very high. You don't have to enrich it very much. And you'll get enough heat to boil water, make steam, run the steam turbines, turn the generators, get your electricity. It doesn't take a whole lot of enrichment. And we know exactly, you know, how much that takes to run a power station. Uh, it takes a whole lot more to make a weapon, a, de uh, a nuclear explosive. So if somebody tells you, well, we're just enriching, you know, we're enriching it so we can run a power station, um, you could tell, if you know anything about nuclear physics, um, you can tell in immediately that they're blowing smoke, you know, that they're, they're, in other words, they're lying to you, or not. You know, you could just tell. You know, if you know that they've got something enriched more than a power station needs, you know why they're doing it. There's only one reason to do it, and that's to make a nuclear weapon. Anyway, so the, 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 the 238 is not a good nucleus because it's not as, it, it, it decays spontaneously in this decay mode. There's other decay modes for uranium-238. You can look them up at, at uh, uh, webelements.com and just click on uranium and then uh, radioactive decay modes, and you'll see a whole list of decay modes. This is one of them. Uh, it spits out an alpha particle. And now the nucleus 
is two protons down and two neutrons down. All right, two protons down means you now have uh, a nucleus of thorium. You no longer have uranium. Because the, the, the identity of the element goes by how many protons are in the nucleus. All right? And so when you go from 92 down to 90, you know, strontium or thorium 90, yeah, that's, that's pretty bad stuff too. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a nuclear reaction, a nuclear decay uh, that is mediated uh, by spitting out an alpha particle, the helium nucleus. Now, an example of beta decay here is uh, this one I, I chose. This is not in your textbook. This is a, a cycle, kind of a chain reaction that goes around and around um, with several uh, isotopes of carbon. By the way, um, let's go back to this. Um, we talked about uranium-238. The different types of uranium, 238 and 235, distinguished by the number of neutrons in the nucleus, those are called isotopes. I'll spell that for you, I-S-O-T-O-P-E-S, -E isotopes. Okay, so uranium-235 is an isotope that's used for nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Uranium-238 is an isotope that is not. It is, but you know what 238 is used for? It's used for... Um, extremely heavy, dense uh, bullets that they fire, that, that airplanes fire. And I, I don't know, anybody here in the Army or has been in the Army? I don't know. Uh, Uranium-enriched slugs that they fire. I know they got them in planes. To, and they, what they do is they kill tanks. They're tank killers. And, you know, because they penetrate anything, just about. If you hit, if you hit it, it's going to go through, it's going to blow up the tank. All right, so that's what they use 238 for. But they don't, use, they don't really use it for, uh, for nuclear weapons or nuclear power. Anyway, so that's an isotope. And this is an isotope of thorium. And the, the nucleus, the alpha particles, there's, there's two different isotopes of helium. There's helium-4 and there's helium-3. Two different isotopes, two different kinds of helium. Now over here, this is a, what we call the CNO cycle. It's a fusion reaction, it's a chain reaction uh, among different uh, isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And in this cycle, there are gamma ray decay modes and there are um, beta decay. And actually, uh, this diagram right here, this one, going from uh, oxygen to a nitrogen nucleus, uh, that's actually not an electron, it's actually a positron. Okay, so this is a positron process here. So it's the antimatter particle of an electron. And so this, and so you get energy. See this little V here? That's the Greek letter nu, that stands for neutrino. So you get a neutrino, you get a positron, and you get energy. And then this uh, nitrogen uh, fuses with hydrogen and helium and becomes a carbon. And then it just goes around in the circle. But anyways, this one, this, ha this particular uh, fusion cycle, it just goes around and around. It produces energy um, and... Uh, you know, for different outputs, here's, a, here's an outgoing helium-4 uh, nucleus, so that's an alpha decay. Uh, these are hydrogens in. Here's four, so there's four hydrogens in, and it goes around the circle, produces gammas, neutrinos, positrons. And then this positron here, and I think there's another positron over here, uh, those positrons, as soon as they... Uh, encounter an electron, zap, you get two x-rays. They'll annihilate themselves together and you get two x-rays. And that contributes to the energy of this reaction. Uh, here's a gamma over here. Uh, matter of fact, let's take a look at this one over here. Here's an yeah, outgoing gamma. Okay, so this is carbon-12. 
plus a, he, a hydrogen nucleus, in other words, a proton, they fuse together and turn into a nitrogen 13 nucleus, and you get a gamma, a gamma ray out. And here, this is positron and neutrino. And this one's hel incoming helium. You get a gamma out, and you get this nitrogen. So it just goes around in a circle. And this is important in stars. The sun will do a little bit of the CNO cycle, but mostly bigger stars than the sun, about 30% bigger or, or larger than that, that, you'll see a lot of this. And the guys that figured this out were the, guy, the scientists up at Oak Ridge and uh, Los Alamos and stuff and uh, Lawrence Livermore labs that were working on hydrogen bombs. And they, you know, in their spare time, they figured out all this stuff about astronomy. So, all right, that's all I want to talk about with nuclear decay and so forth. And that concludes all of our topics for the semester. Uh, let's get ready for a, a review session. And can I have two volunteers from the audience, please? Step forward. I need one more student to help. Nobody's going to help me. OK, here comes Tatiana. All right. Okay. No, you're just going to pass out. Oh, okay. <laughs> nothing, nothing to, let me just get this.